Hi, my name is Paul Conway and I serve as the Chair of Policy and Global Affairs for the American Association of Kidney Patients. Welcome to our fourth annual Policy Summit. In the first session of our summit, we're focused on opportunities, current emerging policy and legislative issues that impact kidney patients here in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, and in the executive branch. Our first speaker in this session is Dr. Shuvo Roy, who serves as a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. He also serves as one of the co-leads for the Kidney Project, along with Dr. William Fazell of Vanderbilt University. Dr. Roy is a professor in the departments of bioengineering and therapeutics science in the schools of pharmacy and medicine. And he's a leader in innovation and research. He's a good friend of AAKP, and he got to know our friend Brian Hess quite well. It's good to see you, Doc. And one of the first questions I want to throw at you is this. Can you tell us in regard to the Kidney Project, which is a Kidney X Prize winning initiative, how the voice of kidney patients has informed your thinking and your research in terms of an artificial implantable kidney, and why it's important to have an independent kidney voice and patient insights available to you as you develop the artificial implantable kidney? Thank you. Thank you. I distinctly remember meeting Brian that day. He came up to me during a break and expressed his enthusiasm for the kidney project and what it meant to him and other patients. I was specially touched that he appreciated the technical barriers that have to be overcome for the kidney project to become a reality. And the challenges that we must have had to deal with and will continue to deal with. Nonetheless, what I also took away from Brian was his emphasis that the Kidney Project offered hope. Hope for countless patients who have otherwise felt left behind by medical progress and told repeatedly that science will eventually solve kidney disease. He encouraged me and my colleague, Dr. William Fizel, to continue involving patients, letting them know of our plans and share not only the successes, but the challenges. I take that message from Brian very personally. It inspires us at the Kidney Project and makes us realize that we're not doing this just for patients, we're doing this together with patients. And obviously Brian, was a key part of the community and we at the Kidney Project miss him and thank him for all he has done in the, for the community. Thank you very much, Dr. Roy. And one last question for you. We're all excited for you for your Kidney X Prize competition win for the Artificial Implantable Kidney and the Kidney Project. And I'm wondering if you could share with us a couple of updates on that. And then looking on the horizon line, what you see for the next year or two for the Kidney Project and what patients can look forward to in terms of news. Thank you. Sure. So we are very fortunate to have been selected as one of the Kidney X uh, winners in the redesign dialysis competition. That has brought us in contact with patients who understand that the product that we, have, we had proposed for the redesigned dialysis, which is a safer and more convenient system for home dialysis, would be likely a product sooner in the timeline than the artificial kidney that combined both mechanical components and cellular components. So what we've done is bring together uh, partners from industry, the patient community, scientists, to focus on adapting our filter technology for the artificial kidney to building a better home hemodialysis system. Over the coming year or so, we'll move this from research into product development with partners that will help us advance this towards clinical trials. So that's the product we call iHemo, or implantable hemodialysis for doing dialysis at home. Now, in terms of the overall kidney project, which is looking to build an implantable artificial kidney, 
we continue to make progress. However, we were impacted by the pandemic and we, our work did slow down. Luckily, my team and colleagues around the country who partner with me continue to do work so the project did not completely shut down. That's great because with all the challenges that we had over the last year, we were really concerned on if we could keep this going without interruption. The good news is we did not shut down. The not so good news is that we were significantly slowed. So what we're going to do in the next year to two is ramp up our progress and continue towards building the implantable artificial kidney for preclinical testing. Over the last few months, we took an important step that we'll share in the coming months with the community. We're able to take the mechanical filter component and the cellular component, both of which we had shown it in the past as independent separate components, we brought them together into a single unit, basically the architecture of an artificial kidney and did an initial preclinical test successfully. It's still very early, but I'm excited that we had success and we are hopeful that in the coming year or two, we'll advance that work. I look forward to working with the AAKP community to continue advancing our project. We've been very lucky to have a partnership since 2018. And one of the key points that the AAKP community has stressed to me and my colleague, Dr. Fizel, is that don't have to aim for the perfect. Make sure you get something that's good enough for patients and that can get to patients within the decade. So we are hopeful that working together with AAKP Renewing our partnership will let us achieve that reality. Thank you so very much, Dr. Roy. And thank you for remembering our good friend, Brian Hess, and for the memories that you have of him and for the insights that he imparted to you and Dr. Fizell, and how you're making certain that those insights are incorporated in the artificial implantable kidney that will save lives, not only here in America, but across the globe. We appreciate it. Our next speaker is our good friend, Rob Blazer, who serves as the Director of Government Affairs for the Renal Physicians Association or as we call him, the Svengali of kidney politics. Rob has been a longtime champion for kidney patients and he's an expert on the legislative process. He works closely with America's frontline nephrologists. He's an expert on CMS issues related to payment. He's an expert on regulatory issues. And at the end of the day, Rob's a very good friend of kidney patients, no matter what organization they belong to, no matter what state they're from. Rob has been an absolutely fantastic coach over the past 20 years getting patients comfortable with Capitol Hill visits, educating them, taking all kinds of questions and phone calls. He's tireless. He's also the recipient of an AAKP President's Award. It's a special honor to have Rob with us today. He's an important person and his time is quite busy. But Rob's gonna lay out for us the terrain for 2021 in the US Congress. Multiple key issues that are going on multiple points for patient advocates like those at AAKP and other organizations to plug into, including the current issue, the Living Donor Protection Act, which as Rob will describe, is going through the sausage making process. But on every single issue that he deals with, Rob reaches out to get the patient perspective first and then aligns that with the interests of doctors and gives a very balanced view of exactly what's going on on Capitol Hill and how it can impact you as a patient. So without further ado, our good friend, Rob Blazer. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, AAKP, for the invite to the Global Policy Summit. As noted, my name is Rob Blazer. I'm Director of Public Policy for the Renal Physicians Association, and I'll be giving an update on what's going on on Capitol Hill right now. What I'll be discussing is the current Hill environment, discuss RPA's 2021 legislative priorities, which I think line up nicely with what AAKP cares about, and then some other relevant legislative issues that the group might be interested in. So with regard to the current Hill environment, we're in the early days of the Biden administration. And what's going on so far is there's been a lot of bipartisan talk, but all partisan action, which isn't terribly surprising and is evidenced by the passage of the American Rescue Plan, but that is what's going on right now. 
Of course, what's gone on with the pandemic and with what happened in early January is probably going to be permanently altering what goes on with regard to Hill advocacy and Hill activities, how often people are able to visit their members of Congress's offices and that sort of thing and security issues. And of course, there is still a very bitter political divide between the two parties. It's going to probably go on for a long time. Democrats currently have control of Congress by just a thread. But this does let them set the agenda, run the committees. But there's still a lot to be worked out between the two parties because, again, the the, the narrow edge, it's 50-50 in the Senate, and it's a much, uh, much narrower margin in the House now. So they really have to thread the needle to get anything done. Now, so what this results in is the fact that bipartisan legislation will be really difficult but not impossible um, and what's happening so far is that the Biden administration is proceeding with everything that they want to do, but they're doing it on a partisan basis. So uh, what's going on so far is the COVID-19 related relief and infrastructure plan. The American Rescue Plan is the one that uh, got passed in March. And the next one for infrastructure is called the American Families Plan. And they're really dominating the, the discussion these days. So it looks like major legislation will only happen through budget reconciliation. This is that one time a year activity where uh, things can be passed on a 51 to 49 vote, for example. Now, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, is going to try and get around this due to some parliamentary machinations, but I don't think that's going to occur. So really, anything's either going to happen through budget reconciliation or with 60 votes in the Senate. So what this means, that what the 50-50 Senate split means is that only motherhood and apple pie measures are going to get through, that is, with the 60 votes. But interestingly enough for us, telehealth legislation might be in that sweet spot. Their leaders in both parties want to see telehealth move forward. It's you know a good way to provide care or an efficient way to provide care. There's a lot of patient convenience involved with that, and it's uh, good, for, good for medicine as well. So we'll see if that happens. And if you don't fall into that sweet spot, the use of the 2022 appropriations process seems like it's the only way it's going to happen before the end of the year. With regard to RPA's 2021 legislative priorities, codification of improvements in and further enhancement of living organ donation. You know, these are the living organ donation bills that have been out for, say, the last four or five Congresses. That's the highest priority for RPA. We also are working on legislation that would make telehealth happen. And the main points of that are to eliminate the originating site and geographic restrictions on the use of telehealth in the U.S. and primarily in Medicare. And then omnibus kidney disease legislation. Uh, every, two, every two years, every Congress, there will be a bill introduced that captures a lot of issues in the kidney space. And what happens is this bill is used as a platform through which provisions are picked out of and get enacted. And there's been some success using that strategy in recent years. So with regard to the living organ donation bill, um, it was in introduced in February and you can see the bill numbers there. Um, currently it has 26 co-sponsors in the House and 24 in the Senate. That 24 in the Senate is a pretty good number. This, as noted before, this is a long time uh, RPA legislative priority and I'm not gonna talk about this in too much detail because I know AAKP is gonna be talking about this in much greater detail elsewhere. So I'll, uh, I'll let them talk about that. With regard to the telehealth legislation, there are a couple different sets of bills out there. There's uh, HR 366, which is the Protecting Access to Post-COVID-19 Tele Telehealth Act of 2021, and the CONNECT Act, and there's one of those in both the House and the Senate, and you can see the bill numbers there. Um, it's kind of interesting that the, the main sponsor of the telehealth bill the HR 366 bill, that's his higher priority as opposed to the CONNECT Act, but he is the original co-sponsor on the CONNECT Act as well. That's uh, Representative Mike Thompson of California. But what the bills would do, as noted before, they would permanently remove the originating site and geographic restrictions on the use of telehealth and Medicare. It would allow permanent waiver authority during public health emergencies. So that means the administration, CMS, Medicare, wouldn't have to go back to Congress to get permission to waive telehealth uh, restrictions if they needed to. It re uh, requires a further study of telehealth utilization and waivers, provides additional resources for oversight. And this is a big deal because the concern of some people who are wary of telehealth is that there could be fraud and abuse. So what the all of these bills would do would be to appropriate money to do further oversight to make sure that fraud and abuse does not occur. 
and it doesn't interfere with the current home dialysis interactions. What I mean by that is that currently for the home dialysis visits between the patient and the physician, those are supposed to occur face-to-face -face at least once quarterly, and RPA and I believe AAKP agree with that, and these bills here would not address that. There are some other telehealth bills out, out, in, the, out in Congress that would waive that quarterly requirement for a face-to-face -face interaction, and RPA firmly believes that that should not occur. So the omnibus bill I talked about that, the community CKD bill, uh, usually it's called something along the lines of, it hasn't been introduced yet, so we don't know exactly what the name is, but something along the lines of the kidney, Chronic Kidney Disease Improvement and Research and Treatment Act. And it has a lot of provisions kind of by design. Again, what'll happen with this bill is that some good provisions will get picked out of this and put into a larger health bill. And among those provisions are one that it would increase access to the Medicare kidney disease education benefit. You know, currently that's only available for CKD stage four patients. This would make available to CKD stage five patients. It would expand the Medicare wellness belt benefit to include uh, KDE screening. Um, promotes a sustainable pathway for innovation. One of the problems in, um, in ESRD payment is that there's no way to pay for technological advances the way there are in other Medicare payment systems. And this would provide that for the ESRD prospective payment system. It modernizes the quality programs that are out there for ESRD payment. This is the quality improvement program and the five-star programs. It guarantees access to Medicaid policy to all ESRD beneficiaries, regardless of age. Right now, it can only be people over 65. Reinstates dialysis services as subject to the Medicare Advantage Network adequ adequacy requirements. Um, this, this, uh, this happened last year when CMS did rulemaking. They did not include dialysis services um, on that list um, of for net network adequacy, and this would make them do that. But the bill hasn't come yet, out yet. It, it, by the time you hear this, it might be out. Um, but for now, it has not been introduced. So other relevant legislative issues. Uh, one thing that RPA is very involved in is the Healthcare Workforce Resilience Act. This would take visas that aren't otherwise being used and would expire time-limited visas and provide them to healthcare workers, uh, physicians and nurses so that they can stay in this country and, and, and pr promote the workforce and reinforce the workforce. So that's something that RPA has endorsed and feels strongly about. There's also in, uh, movements to increase funding for kidney health policy initiatives at both NIH, the, um, the National Institute of Health and NIDDK, that's the institute within NIH that covers kidney diseases. That would be at the, to the tune of about $285 million. And the Kidney X Initiative, which would uh, promote innovation in kidney care. And I think there's reason to be optimistic on, on, on both of those issues. It seems as if the light bulb's been going on, um, going on for people who were resistant to providing additional funding, research funding for, uh, for those initiatives. So that's a good thing. Other things that might come up. Um, possible legislation promoting staff-assisted home dialysis, although I think that's really a long shot. We don't even have a bill yet, but that is being discussed. And then legislation creating a dialysis facility-centered payment model. These were known as the ESRD Patients Act or the BETTER Act, and this would be as opposed to models promoting CKD care, home dialysis, or transplantation. Both of these last, last two bullets are real long shots. I wouldn't expect them to occur but they are things that are out there that people are discussing with regard to kidney disease care. And that's it for my presentation. I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much, AAKP, for the invitation. Um, there is our uh, RPAs and my Twitter information there, and there's RPA's website, and follow AAKP. I would never encourage anyone to get on Twitter, but if you're there already and you care about health policy issues, um, Follow me, follow RPA, and follow AAKP, and you'll, you'll be kept up to date on things. Thank you so much, and take care. Bye. Thank you very much, Rob, and thank you to the Renal Physicians Association for your longtime support of the American Association of Kidney Patients and for the many, many trips that we've made to Capitol Hill together as patients and doctors to bring our voices to the fight against kidney diseases with great respect. Our next speaker is Chris Leibenguth. And Chris serves as the Director of Federal Affairs and Alliance Development for Baxter Healthcare. Baxter's been a longtime leader as well in the field of kidney disease innovations and treatments. 
and Chris has the unusual role of serving both as a champion for patient alliance development and as the person who sets the agenda for Baxter Healthcare in Washington. He prioritizes the issues and then looks to find the allies that are most important to support their efforts. AAKP has been a longtime friend of Baxter. We've done many things on Capitol Hill and across the executive branch together. And they're a leader in home dialysis, an issue that is close to the heart for AAKP so that patients can have the choices they need in a timely basis. One of the issues that Chris is gonna connect with us on is the high priority that has to happen in terms of coordination between regulatory agencies and payment agencies and how the lack of that coordination can sometimes interfere with the access patients should have to timely treatment. Hey Chris, just a couple of questions for you. I know that Baxter, all the way from the research side to the development side, to manufacturing, to government affairs, has always been interested in the insights of patients incorporating those insights. And you've demonstrated the same interest in AAKP's ability to collect insights, both at the national level and as we've expanded globally. Can you tell me how patient insights inform research and development and product development at Baxter and how important that independent patient voice is to have as an ally? So an independent patient, patient voice is essential to everything we do at Baxter. All of the things you list, research and development, manufacturing, and public policy engagement is all predicated by and with the patient voice. In many respects, it's our guiding light. Uh, we can't make those decisions in a vacuum. So to successfully build new therapies, we have to have that patient voice. To physically build them, manufacture them, we have to have that patient voice. And to appropriately advocate for better regulatory and payment policies, we have to have that patient voice. And I think the most important word that you used in your question is independent. Uh, this doesn't work if it's a situation of the cart leading the horse. We uh, have to pr uh, properly hear the patient. Uh, that voice has to be independent, otherwise it's not real. And if it's not real, then all of our work falls apart. It loses its value. And so in a lot of in many respects, the patient voice, the independent patient voice is critical to everything we do. Hey Chris, here's a second question for you. AAKP, as you know, has been a longtime champion of patient care choice. And we firmly believe that quality care is defined by treatments that allow patients to pursue their aspirations. So one of the questions I have for you is, when we engage with the federal government, we try to make certain that agencies, whether they're regulatory or payment, are thinking in terms of how do you move innovation together as a group of agencies to make certain that timely delivery of new innovations is not held up in the bureaucratic process. So as patients, we have a viewpoint on that, but I'm interested if you could give our viewers a viewpoint from industry's standpoint on what the best case scenario is when there's alignment with regulatory agencies and payment agencies and what the worst case scenario is and how you think that translates into patient access. Thank you. Thanks. So for me, it's pretty straightforward. We need federal agencies that regulate innovations to be aligned. If you have two agencies that have differing, not necessarily competing, but differing points of views on, let's say, what is critically relevant or clinically re relevant to a patient, then we're going to have problems. Why is that? Because we, the manufacturer, will drive the collection of evidence to, to meet one standard, but then another agency will want to see something different. Then we're in a situation where the innovation gets essentially jammed up in the system. When one agency looks at our data and says, yeah, this looks good, and another says, looks at the same data and says, no, this isn't what we're looking for, well, that's a problem. So encouraging alignment between these agencies or maybe creating that alignment becomes really important. When we're looking at what the next innovation is, what goes through our minds? Well, it's A, how do we build it? And then B, how do we prove that it does what we say it does? And that process starts at the very beginning for us. So what we need is consistency in terms of what the government expects to see. Um, and so bringing this back to the patient voice, there's another reason why having a strong independent patient voice is so critical because that voice can inform the government and help them build that consistency. Once we have the consistency, once those agencies are aligned in terms of what they're looking for, when we build the innovations, we can sort of set out to prove 
based on this, all these sort of aligned standards, right? And then we have a sort of a direct pathway where those innovations can be built, they can be proven to be safe and effective, but also uh, improve outcomes, and then they can get right into patients' hands. Um, when we have that, that disalignment, when we have agencies that have different requirements, um, then we have problems where people are doing innovation, but it's not reaching patients. And I think that that's the worst case scenario. Uh, we can fix that by engaging government, by patients being loud and vocal, uh, but also encouraging them to meet the same standards um, and it maybe even helping create mechanisms that allow them to do so. Hey, Chris, a final question for you. Can you tell me what the practical impacts of COVID-19 have been on the issue of home dialysis and patient access to home dialysis? And then the second part of the question is, can you tell us if there are any issues that are moving through the U.S. Congress right now or in federal agencies that impact patient access to home dialysis care or some of the new innovations that you see on the horizon line that are coming to accommodate patients who want to do more home care in the COVID-19 environment? Thank you. Um, thanks. So, you know, COVID presented hu a huge challenge for home, sort of the home dialysis uh, realm. And what happened essentially is you had this renewed interest in patients going home, both new patients and existing patients, because, you know, obviously they wanted to be in the safety of their homes and there was an option, home dialysis that existed. So there was this interest in movement towards home dialysis. But that interest ran into some some uh, tough sort of structural realities, things like nursing shortages or just simply not enough space in an operating room to do a catheter placement. So like logistical hurdles that that had to be overcome. And in a lot of sense, a lot of these things are solvable. But the one thing that I think that we need to focus on the most is ensuring that um, patients have better connectivity to their uh, their providers, you know, um, this is a very scary time for patients. Um, going home also presents another sort of hurdle in that you're not you're in the safety of your own home, but you're you don't have that clinician around you all the time. Um, and the thing that we need to work on, uh, the thing that I think patients need to advocate for, is more telehealth, more connectivity with that clinician. And that in some ways is going and advocating to Congress, to policymakers, that any sort of barriers that exist that make it difficult to access um, uh, their clinician using modern technology, um, it needs, needs to be removed. It needs to be an easier prospect for a patient to, to talk to, to send their remote uh, data that, you know, you have your cycler, your cycler is collecting data. That data can be then sent to the, to the nurse and the nurse can print it off and give it to the, the clinician. That process needs to be easier and more straightforward and it needs to be incentivized, right? Because if we can incentivize that, then when we as backs are in a position to sort of continue to put new innovations in that sort of digital tool realm out into the market to help patients even further. And the more you have that, the more that that patient then feels um, uh, much more comfortable about being at home, being in the safety of their own home, uh, being able to afford all of the, the great things that home dialysis provides, you know, being able to keep your job, um, giving more flexibility in, in, in terms of how you want to live your life. But then in terms of how you manage the kidney disease um, and, and manage the dialysis, having those patient tools, having those digital tools, well, those then sort of wrap themselves around the patient. And so, it, you know, if there are policies out there that, you know, I think are put in place for good reasons, you know, to protect patients, to make sure that the telehealth isn't sort of like the Wild West, I think that they're worth re-examining, given that we just went through all of this COVID stuff, that, that we were in our homes and had to adapt in a way that maybe we weren't prepared to do, and in a lot of sense, it, it worked well, right? Like we, we, we did a lot of things at home that we didn't expect that we were going to do, just to say everyone, right? Well, why can't we then create a new paradigm where patients can use digital tools, rely on remote patient monitoring, um, and, and give them more of a peace of mind and more connectivity to their clinician that allows them more independence? 
I think that that's the direction we need to go in, in terms of home dialysis. And I think that, again, that patient voice, that independent patient voice is critical to making sure policymakers understand that this is what patients want, that they want to have, they want to live their life more normally. Right, and and that's achievable if we can think through how to to sort of bootstrap some of these tools into sort of how people are cared for. Thank you very much, Chris. We appreciate Baxter's support for our fourth annual policy summit. Baxter's been a longtime innovation leader in the field of kidney diseases, and we appreciate the steady dedication they've brought to this issue and their support for our summits over the previous four years. Our next speaker is Chris Porter, the Vice President for Government Affairs for Trevere Therapeutics. And Trevere has been leading the way in innovation in the field of rare kidney diseases. They've organized a broad-based coalition to support legislative action to bring more resources to the National Institutes of Health and attention to the issue of rare disease and the lack of innovation. With pleasure, our next speaker is Chris Porter. Go right ahead, Chris. Well, hello. Uh, my name is Chris Porter, and I'm Vice President of Government Affairs and Policy for Trevere Therapeutics. Uh, and I want to thank everybody at AAKP and everyone in the nephrology and rare disease communities for giving me the chance to spend a little time with you today and talk about the rare kidney disease revolution. For those of you who don't know me or know Trevere, uh, we are 100% focused on rare disease. And our mission is to identify, develop, and deliver hope and life-changing uh, therapies for people living with rare disease. I'm also a rare disease patient myself. And just like a lot of other people at Trevere, I take that mission with me everywhere I go uh, because it's central to everything that we do. So what I wanna do is give you a little sense and let you know about the excitement that's happening in rare kidney disease. You may or may not know this, uh, but rare kidney diseases affect uh, thousands and thousands of Americans. Easily over 100,000 suffer uh, from rare kidney disease. These can be diseases like IgA nephropathy or FSGS, minimal change disease. And for years and years, uh, there's been no innovation in rare kidney diseases. In fact, there's been no advancements in treatment uh, since the invention of dialysis about 40 years ago. But thanks uh, to, to um, 21st century cures, thanks to the FDA, uh, and thanks to innovative companies, there is right now a sea change uh, of innovation that's taking place in the clinic. And that innovation is delivering hope for those thousands of patients that are living with rare kidney diseases. So we're excited because we're at the front of that and we're excited to be partnering uh, with AAKP on a number of initiatives to try to uh, take this issue forward. And right now, as we speak, there's about 20 companies that have about the same number of products that are in the clinic right now being tested to give treatments, novel treatments for the first time in 40 years to people living with rare kidney disease. And so what we do today, the public private collaborations, they're really gonna determine the future. And these rare kidney diseases and having novel therapies for them could really make the difference and maybe ultimately change how we treat chronic kidney disease overall. I want to thank uh, AAKP and NFCURE Kidney International for what we did together last fall. So last fall, we got together with over 40 different organizations and three work groups to think about this new upcoming era of kidney health. We had uh, three days where we got together and explored policy issues uh, from across the spectrum. And all, ultimately, uh, all the input from that roundtable was captured in a report that we released uh, during Kidney Week last fall. And as you can see, the roundtable had uh, amazing support from Congress, from the administration, uh, and really was a groundbreaking event for the first time to consider now that we have novel treatments, or now that we're going to have novel treatments for rare kidney disease, how can we save the most lives and save the most money. So these these were some of the outcomes that came out of the out of the the policy roundtable, and as you can see, each one of these uh, really carries a lot of weight on its own. The thing we heard most is that rare kidney disease patients really were overlooked in the system. Uh, so and it's it's an urgent problem, 
and they were often overlooked. And oftentimes their disease was diagnosed late or even it was uh, discounted uh, by the providers that they saw. And it was hard to find uh, someone who really understood it. As we, I mentioned early on, it was clear too that there was a lot of hope that these uh, new novel therapies could change the dynamic for all kidney disease, not just those living with rare kidney disease. Certainly because uh, African-Americans uh, and other people of color are disproportionately affected by rare kidney disease, trying to address this will definitely promote health equity. And when you think about the fact that so many people who have chronic kidney disease uh, ultimately end up, you know, as part of the government, uh, the, uh, on the government, uh, uh, you know, uh, on Medicare Part B, uh, it really would behoove everybody to take a look at this and see how are we going to change the current system to emphasize prevention and kidney health up front. But most of what we heard was that there was hope out there. For the first time, the thousands and thousands of people living with rare kidney disease had hope that their life would be a little bit better. The roundtable itself had a number of detailed rec uh, recommendations, but I think that uh, the, the quote that's uh, before you right now really represents what it's all about and why we put the round table together with AKP and FQ Kidney International. Kelly Helms, the mother of an FSGS patient, uh, a girl named Macy, and she said, you know, that the cost of not treating rare kidney disease is like an impossible chronic state of constant medical interventions, consuming upwards of 20 medications with a plethora of comorbidities. It severely decreased quality of life and both physically and economically, we deserve better. And we certainly agree, and I know everybody that's attending the summit understands that people living with rare kidney disease certainly deserve better. So this innovation holds the hope for the very first time that we're gonna be able to deliver better. What, where we're at as a community, the 40 different organizations that took part in the round table, AAKP, Trevere, um, NEVCURE, and other leading nephrology organizations, we're trying to take those recommendations and turn them into action. So we know that there's a new Congress and there's a new administration. So we're working together on a bill that would, that would turn those recommendations into action. And why do we wanna do that? Is because we really know we're on the, the precipice of this new era in kidney health. There's gonna be these novel treatments and, you know, um, these won't be on the market until next year uh, or in, in, in the very near future, but there's a num there's so many that are coming that we know that it's gonna be, uh, you know, not all of them will make it of course, uh, but we know that it's gonna be uh, it, it, an exciting new era for patients. So these new novel treatments are gonna be out there. They're gonna address this overlooked and urgent problem in rare kidney disease. Uh, that's ultimately holds the promise to reduce those ESKD costs and, and, and promote health equity, as we said. So we wanna take uh, legislation uh, as, a, as a community and we wanna take it forward. And right now we're discussing with leaders in Congress, including members of the Rare Disease Caucus, members of the Kidney Caucus, about trying to do this this year. What are some of the recommendations that came out of the round table that we want to put into a bill that would ultimately end up changing policy that would change lives? Well, there's a few things here. Uh, and I wanna emphasize that all these recommendations right now are draft uh, until our friends in Congress uh, take them forward. But really we wanna give rare kidney disease research a home uh, within our government. We heard in the round table that there were a number of diagnostic challenges that rare families face when they have rare kidney diseases. Uh, uh, you know, everyone is excited about genomic medicine. People are concerned how your analysis uh, is, is not routine anymore. And biopsy and obtaining biopsies is always a challenge. So we wanna find ways to promote consensus on that. We wanna zero in on communities of color uh, who are disproportionately affected by these rare kidney diseases. We wanna have exciting community partnership grants, right? We wanna do uh, fellowships to get more communities of color into nephrology. And of course, we need to do, do more research. 
Uh, but we really need to make that uh, a principal focus of what we're doing if we want to get the outcomes uh, that we want for everyone living with rare kidney disease. Certainly providers, uh, they said very clearly that they want and need more education. Uh, we wanna make sure that when coverage decisions are made, when that family, uh, like Kelly, uh, when Kelly, uh, when decisions are made that, that at, the, at a minimum, uh, somebody who's an expert in that rare kidney disease is involved in that coverage decision. And then at the end of the day, we really would think it would be great uh, for the administration to take some type of uh, demonstration project that finds those people who have, you know, earlier stage CKD, often driven by these rare kidney diseases, and gives them the care and the treatment that they need to ultimately delay or prevent dialysis or transplant. As long as they can have a healthy and uh, robust renal system, uh, that's going to help everybody uh, in the long run. So that's really where we are today. We started this last year because of the wave of innovation that's coming. We started looking at the policy questions. We started looking at the lives of, rare, of families living with rare kidney disease. We all, all did the hard work and we got together across the spectrum to make recommendations. And now we want to take those forward. On behalf of Trevere, I want to invite you to join us. Uh, join AAKP, uh, who's been a tremendous partner in this effort. We're trying to put a spotlight on these families living with rare kidney disease. Join NEFCARE Kidney International and, and uh, feel free to visit uh, rarekidneyrevolution.com to learn more, to download the recommendations. And then we're happy to work with you to ensure that Congress uh, and the administration understands the needs of rare families living with rare kidney disease and can really make a difference going forward. So thank you for your time today. Uh, and we look forward to walking down this road together.